We're good to begin, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Jared. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dan McKiernan. I'm the director at the Division of Marine Fisheries. And tonight we're holding a public hearing on, uh, on basically four uh, major issues. Uh, there's another public hearing uh, two nights from now, Wednesday night, on some other management issues pertaining to quarter minute species. But tonight uh, we're, we're taking these uh, separately. Um, we are holding this hearing under provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, uh, Section 130, I'm sorry, Chapter 130, Sections 217, 80, and 104, uh, taking comment on these items to amend the Code of Massachusetts Regulations at 322 CMR, Chapters 6 and 7. Um, you're on the call tonight. Uh, we are going to uh, accept your comments tonight. We're also going to accept written comment through Sunday, March 20th. And we would uh, like you to send written comments if that's your preference or to follow up if you'd like. But we'd also like you to send those to a special mailbox at the marine.fish at mass.gov, which you can see on the screen. Um, I, would, uh, I would ask you to, to use that as your, as your primary uh, uh, repository for your comments. In the past, some folks have sent comments directly to me and I, I may have read them, but I was unaware that, that that same comment didn't go to the mailbox. And on some occasions, those comments didn't get into the, 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 uh, the package that we sent to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission when we go to, to rulemaking. So it's much more uh, efficient if you use that mailbox at marine.fish at mass.gov. So please use that. Um, it, it, uh, it'll make sure that your comments do get to the commission. Uh, I know we have some commission members on tonight, uh, but some of them um, uh, depend on on uh, the written comments and or listening to the to the recording of this uh, session as well. So um, next slide, Jared. Uh, the, the rules of engagement tonight. For if if any of you uh, have joined us before, you know that uh, we manage this uh, pretty efficiently. Um, the the rules are um, uh, you know tonight we're here to get your comments to submit your opinions, your arguments on specific amendments that are being proposed. And we wanna get uh, a sense of whether you approve or you oppose, or you think we need to uh, amend the proposals in some way. If you have comments on matters outside of the scope, then we would take those after the, the main part of the hearing. We'll, we'll uh, leave some time at the end for public comment on some other issues, if you'd like. Um, we mute all members of the public during the presentation. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we will first accept clarifying questions. And then once the questions are addressed, we'll invite public comments on the proposals. We uh, disable the chat and the question and answer functions. You may have been on some other webinars like this uh, where you can send chat messages all through it. Uh, we find that's uh, really, really uh, not only distracting, but um, can be misleading. And depending on what people are writing, kind of creates a lot of chaos. So we, we disable that, but we do um, uh, do our best to comment directly to whatever comments you want to make um, as, uh, in, the, in, the, in the oral fashion, you know, not, in the, uh, not in the chats. Um, you can also follow up with DMF staff after this, you know, by sending them an email if you want to ask clarifying questions that didn't get answered, um, and, and we'll be happy to answer questions over the next few days. Uh, when participating in the question and comment forums, you need to raise your hand with the uh, raise hand function, uh, and this creates the queue and DMF will recognize and unmute you um, and take you in order. Uh, we'll give you three minutes for questions and comments. And we'll also allow follow-up comments uh, or questions after others have had a chance to speak. Uh, it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's not necessary for you to provide verbal comment. Uh, you can use this hearing as an opportunity just to learn and you can submit written comments later. Uh, in fact, we do recommend uh, sending written comments if you'd like to be the most effective. Um, and we also prefer that you or, or request that you submit them all by uh, March 20th uh, when we're going to turn off the public comment period 
uh, and then we're going to go to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission uh, on April 7th uh, with the proposal for final action. So it's important for you to get those comments to us by the 20th so we can compile them all and get them to the commission. Um, as always, this is a public hearing. It's going to be recorded and the questions and comments are part of the public record. And it's also going to be available on DMF's YouTube channel. So thanks for bearing with me about the rules of engagement. Uh, next, just briefly, we have four um, major uh, bullets to, to discuss tonight. The first is the commercial Manhattan season. Uh, we're proposing to create a, an opening day of Manhattan season, uh, and we'll get into that detail. It's gonna be June 1st. Um, second is a bluefish minimum size for the commercial sector. Uh, at this point, there is none. Uh, third is uh, the striped bass permitting. We have something called a control date, which is uh, just the date that we would enact as a rule that should we uh, want to uh, uh, establish some kind of a limited entry scheme uh, in the future, like we do have in many other fisheries, uh, we want to update that control date. Um, and then finally, a set of, of housekeeping uh, cor uh, correctional, technical corrections, or just clarifying our rules. And Jared's going to speak to that. Uh, Jared Silver is going to be giving a lot of the presentation tonight. And he is our regulation specialist. And uh, he is uh, uniquely qualified to talk about some of these issues, especially those that have to do with uh, interpreting these regulations. Jared not only drafts the regulations, he works closely with the environmental police. So, uh, so they uh, receive copies of the regulations and, and understand uh, them fully. Uh, the timeline again, uh, tonight is March 14th, we're holding the hearing. March 20th, at the end of the public comment period, April 1st, we send the, the uh, recommendation to the commission. On April 7th, the commission votes. And on April 29th, uh, you'll see final regulations uh, filed, which go into effect uh, two weeks later at the Secretary of State's office. So next slide, please. So Jared, um, I'm going to um, let you cover this one in some detail. Uh, this has to do with the uh, commercial Menhaden opening day. I, I just would open up by saying, or introduce you, Jared, by saying that um, the, the way we manage this particular fishery is complicated, but it's also fairly successful. We, we do get a lot of positive uh, feedback from a, a lot of folks on our management of this. It goes back three, four decades, uh, maybe longer. Um, it can be controversial at times uh, with, uh, you know, industrial um, scale fishing going on uh, very close to shore for a forage species. But we've, we do our best to try to keep the uh, users um, you know, from, uh, from, from being at odds with one another, but also to do things like deliver bait uh, for uh, fish, uh, other fisheries that desperately need it. And at the same time, provide uh, good fishing opportunities for recreational fishermen who, who like to have um, a fair amount of forage uh, left in the water. So Jared, why don't you go through the uh, our proposals for commercial Menhaden, and then when you're done, I'll, t I'll take uh, some comments on that issue about uh, Friday fishing in the Boston Harbor area, which is not on the uh, public hearing agenda, but I did promise uh, my Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission that I would take comments on that particular issue tonight. So take it away, Jared. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, so wanted to start off just to give you some basic background on, on how this fishery is permitted and managed so that you can understand the context of the proposal uh, that we're setting forth tonight. So there are effectively three classes of commercial Manhattan fishing in Massachusetts. The first class is that group of vessels that may fish at the limited access trip limits, which are those limits above 6,000 pounds, uh, and fish inside and outside the inshore net areas, the inshore net areas being those inshore waters such as Gloucester Harbor and uh, Boston Harbor, uh, where they may use fur sands and also fish outside those area in open waters with fur sands or other gears as permitted, such as um, weirs um, in inshore waters or um, uh, surface gill nets. The second class is uh, that group that has a limited entry endorsement that can fish at the higher trip limits that holds a cap or a cap per se permit that allows them to fish 
at those higher limits um, in those waters seaward of the inshore net areas. And they may fish other gear such as weirs or surface gill nets if those permits are held. And then that last class of permit holders are those who do not hold the Menhaven permit endorsement, um, but may hold a calf or a surface gill net or fish weir permit and may fish seaward of the inshore net areas with fur seines or with surface gill nets or fish weirs and retain up to 6,000 pounds of menhaden. Um, so moving from there, we'll look at how the fisheries manage. Uh, the open access fishery is open from January 1 until the quota is taken at a 6,000 pound limit. Uh, when fishing at that 6,000 pound limit, fish must be stored in barrels and there's a maximum per se in size. The limited access fishery open January 1 until the quota, until the quota is taken. Starts off at 125,000 pound trip limit. That trip limit stays in effect until 85% of the quota is taken, at which point is reduced to 25,000 pounds until 100% of the quota is taken. Once our quota is taken, Massachusetts may enroll into the episodic event set aside, which is 1% of the overall coastwide menhaded quota set aside by the uh, interstate FMP. Uh, to the states of New York through Maine, should large amounts of menhaden be episodically available in their waters, resulting in an earlier than anticipated quota closure. Uh, the past several seasons, we have enrolled in this program. Uh, under this, the limited access fishery may continue at a level up to 120,000 pounds, um, and the open access fishery may continue at 6,000 pounds. Um, the mat, well, the max trip limit in the ESSA fishery is 120,000 pounds under the uh, management plan. We frequently adopt a lower trip limit. Uh, we set a 25,000 pound trip limit for this fishery in 2021. Then once the quota is closed, there's an incidental catch at small scale fishery uh, that uh, continues to allow fishing to occur at that 6,000 pound level. Uh, regardless of permit type, if you're fishing in that level, you're subject to the maximum per se in size and the storage of fish and totes or barrels upon retention. So what we're seeing here is uh, the past two years, particularly in 2020, uh, 2021 rather, uh, the harvest of Manhattan began earlier than usual uh, in late May, and we harvested a sizable amount of the quota in that late May, early June period. Uh, the graph to the left shows the use of the quota over the past five years throughout the season. The graph to the right shows uh, use the quota over the past five years just in late May. So you can see how, how quickly that quota was taken in 2021 compared to recent years. Um, to that effect, we reduced the trip limit to 25,000 pounds on June 12th. Um, our initial quota of 5.42 million pounds was taken on June 17th. We entered the episodic event of set aside fishery and that lasted about a month from June 18th to July 17th. We landed about 1.96 million pounds. We reopened the quota fishery on July 19th with transfers of about 2.5 million pounds from other states to Massachusetts, which kept the fishery open through the end of, uh, through, through the beginning of August and we closed after August 10th. So what we're looking for for tonight is, is uh, one minor change to the way this fishery is managed, and that is to keep the limited access fishery closed until June 1. Uh, an exemption to this would be uh, fish weirs uh, who may have that limited access menhaden endorsement and may catch um, menhaden incidentally um, in their weirs during that May period. We would want to allow them to land that and not have to discard it. So this would effectively just be the limited access per se in fishery that would be subject to this rule. Um, our goal here is to extend the availability of quota later into the summer. In doing so, uh, have more overlap with the lobster fishery and better align bait demand to bait harvest uh, and reduce the reliance on quota transfers and ESSA and the incidental set aside fishery. Uh, particularly as the use of the incidental set-aside fishery may be limited in 2023 following amendments or addendums to the interstate management plan. Uh, we spoke with our colleagues up in, up in Maine uh, over the winter, and uh, they kind of briefed us on 
their establishment of a start date for uh, June 14th in 2021 and why they did it. And there's a lot of, a, a, it's an analogous situation there. And, and their report back to us was, you know, it was a successful management adjustment to help better align the bait harvest with the bait demand. And, you know, for that reason, you know, it, it encouraged us to, to, to forge ahead with this, this proposal. So, Dan, I think the best way to do this is probably just to go issue by issue and take comments. Um, so as this is the first issue uh, that we have on the agenda tonight, uh, why don't we take comments on it now? Um, so if any members of the public would like to comment on the June 1 start date to the limited entry um, Menhaden fishery, you can use the raise hand function. I will acknowledge you in the order that you've raised your hands. We'll take questions and comments. When you're done with your question and comments, your hand will be lowered. And uh, if you have a follow-up question or follow-up comment, we'll get to you. Um, once everyone else has had an opportunity to say, to, to, to have their, share, share their thoughts. And then um, if you don't want to speak tonight, you don't have to, again, you can provide a written comment to us via email. So if you have any questions, you can use the raise hand function and I'll recognize you now or any comments. All right, Dan, I'm not seeing any comments on this proposal or questions on this proposal. Do you want to move to the next item? Sure, Jared. So am I to understand that if the attendees, uh, uh, a lack of comments means that there's general uh, endorsement of us moving to a June 1st start date? I guess that's okay. an open question. I see Eric Lorenzen's hands up. Eric, you're acknowledged. Hi. I can hear you. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, I'm in. For, I'm for this. You know, since it lines up with the lobster fishery and it gives the local guys a better chance at getting bait, I don't see it as being an issue until the fish start showing up early and then leaving early. If that ever becomes a scenario, but that's further down the line. We don't know yet. All right. Thank you, Eric. Dan, I'm not saying anything else. Okay. So we'll, we'll move ahead to the next item. All right. I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thanks, Jared. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I promised my Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission that I would take comments on, um, I guess this is a sensitive issue. And Jared mentioned earlier that, uh, that we have um, a, a set of boats. We have um, nine vessels that have been grandfathered in historically that are allowed to seine in what we call the internet areas. For example, Boston Harbor, Gloucester Harbor, Salem Harbor, those are all part of our intranet areas. This is a, a regulation that goes back to the 70s uh, when uh, uh, under Director Coates uh, in order to use a net in, in some of our uh, near shore estuaries and harbors, you had to have a, uh, a specific permit to do that. And uh, so today we have about nine boats that are um, allowed to fish inside our intranet areas, which is a small population. And um, I'm very comfortable with that because uh, those uh, permit holders are, are experienced and um, we hope that because they have standing, they know the, the community of fishermen around them, uh, that the number of conflicts and, um, and um, you know, uh, issues are minimized on the water because, you know, it's, it's fishing in somewhat crowded conditions, it's fishing near mooring areas, it's fishing in channels you know, a navigational channel sometimes. And, and so, um, you know, personally as director, um, you know, I, when I look back at the history of, of seining inside the, these harbors and estuaries, it, it has uh, sparked a lot of controversy, you know, in the past, not so much recently. And so um, about 15 years ago, uh, there was a request on the part of some of the Boston Harbor uh, recreational fishing interests, uh, notably charter boats, to close Boston Harbor on Fridays. And um, that area was closed. And, and these rules are, um, are, are not regulations. They're enacted as permit conditions 
by the director. These inshore net permits uh, can be amended on the fly, um, you know, by the director, by me, um, and um, and that's the 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 regulatory. I'm sorry, the the rule um, making approach that we use because we can react to uh, to any unforeseen issues, uh, and it is a small group of fishermen. So. Um, we, uh, we, we have been um, allowing, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we did prohibit Boston Harbor seining on Fridays for uh, well over a decade. And then last year, uh, we opened it up for the first time. Um, and, uh, and we did this because we felt that the, the operators that would be fishing in that area would be sensitive to sort of the, the intricacies of, of fishing in the crowded Boston Harbor complex. And um, for the most part, I think it was successful. Uh, we did have um, some complaints about a particular vessel and I have taken action under my authority um, to condition those permits and that particular vessel uh, won't be fishing uh, this year in the Boston Harbor area um, as a permit condition. And, um, and I hope that the remaining vessels that will be fishing in the Boston Harbor area um, you know, can continue to coexist with many of the other interests, many of the other users. So I guess this is an opportunity and it was, it was kind of queued up to me that if, since this was going to public hearing to uh, talk about the start date, that many of the users of the resource, many of the participants in the fishery would be um, together in this call or in this hearing. And this might be an opportunity to take comments. Uh, my, my, um, my plan is to allow it on Fridays, except for that one boat that uh, I felt violated one of the permit conditions was, which is a vague one, but it is a historic one going back into the original permit conditions established by previous directors, which is to have the, the saners avoid uh, concentrations of recreational fishing activity. Um, and so, you know, that's a, that's a tough, tough thing to to define, but um, we did see some some reports and some videos where, in, in one case, the saner um, kind of set fairly close to uh, and and directly around um, some boats that were fishing. So, so anyway, so I I do want to give the public an opportunity to weigh in on this question about Friday saning uh, in the Boston Harbor complex. So, um, I'll take any questions or comments. Again, this wouldn't be a rule that I would put forward to our commission. It is a permit condition that I have the ability to amend and I just wanna be sensitive to um, the various concerns uh, among all users. And so this might be a good opportunity for folks to weigh in. So, so Jared, why don't you, uh, or uh, to the members of the public, if you'd raise your hand, um, we can um, take some comments and continue this conversation. Jared, I see Michael, Michael Elise. Elise. Yep. Michael. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I know this is a uh, special permit, the inshore. There's only a few handful of them. Is that correct? Yeah, we have so, nine and five active. So there are nine in individuals one, in the state. Yep. The ones I know that I've ran into are safe and they follow the rules. But I want to know how this permit is policed. There is mayhem with other boats trying to sneak in to those inshore areas, i.e. Salem, Salem Harbor, Salem Sound. They come from the Sound and go into those inshore areas, Beverly, Manchester, all the small ones, when the other boats aren't around. Who's policing these other boats that are coming in and sneaking around and they're not one of the nine. They're not supposed to be there. Any um, comments? Yeah, enforcement of this is done through the, the Massachusetts Environmental Police. So if there's- and Reading up on some of the rules, you're supposed to contact the harbor master when you go into these areas. Well, actually, Michael, um, that's a good point. And we have different arrangements with, with different harbor masters. For example, in Salem, um, there, was a, uh, there was a request by the harbor master because 
um, a few years ago, and maybe ongoing, the um, there was a lot of construction, uh, shore, you know, shoreside construction, and a lot of vessels that were traveling uh, back and forth related to the construction project, as well as um, uh, passenger vessel, uh, passenger ferries that were active. And and so, in order to properly manage all that, uh, the harbor master, uh, you know, in, in order to to make it work, wanted them to call in in advance in case he wanted to keep them out. Um, and so that is true, but not every harbor. Uh, okay, master... I, was just, I was just curious, cause I, you know, the, um, the regular boats are good. You know, yeah. they play by the rules, but you know, when, how do you, how are you guys just plan on just, just well, maintaining well, Michael, this? Let me, yeah. let me just say that, um, you know, and, and we can send you uh, our, a link for the regulations, the, the code of Massachusetts yeah. regulations where each of these harbors is defined. So I just want yeah, to make sure that, that you're I, aware. I was looking into, I um, inquire about moving some of the inshore permit lines back. Why can't the, the line go back to Bakers or, you know, like out to the islands, just like Boston Harbor. And can we get included Salem being in that, Friday no zone. Why does it have to just be Boston Harbor? I think a, a lot of the quota you'll find when you see your trip reports are coming out of those areas. Some of the biggest boats were in that Salem Harbor yanking pogies out. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have all the data to see where they came from. So. Yeah. So again, uh, we were, there's, there's various uh, goals with some of these rules and certainly the, um, the one about conflict on the water um, was it's traffic. You know it, like you say, it's safety. It's trafficy out there too. Yeah. It's 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 hectic with those boats working. Yeah, and so in Salem particularly, that's why the harbor master wanted to work very closely with those vessels, and that's why we had a call-in requirement. So, uh, but but getting back to Boston Harbor, that was a particular request on the part of some charter boat captains that fished the Boston Harbor complex, asked us to prevent uh, fishing on Fridays. And, and that was in response to a particular Santa who's now retired, who was fishing behind um, a closure line off of uh, Quincy. And so, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a, a difficult situation for everyone involved. Uh, but at this point, what I'm looking for is, is, is comments on the, the Boston Harbor Friday okay. question. Sorry. Yeah, I know. It's just, you know. No, but it, it's fair. I mean, I, I, I'm interested in hearing your, all of your, your concerns. Um, and as far as the definitions of the harbors itself, do you need copies of that or do you already have that? I have copies. Okay, fine. All right. Um, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Scott. Scott Jolly. Do we lose him, Jared? No. Scott, you can unmute yourself. I think we lost him. All right, Scott, we're going to have to come back to you. Mike Delzingo? Yes, hello. Hi, Mike. Uh, I would like to make a comment that I don't think uh, Friday should be open to hall seating in Boston Harbor. Uh, we fought like hell a decade ago to end this for one boat, uh, and it seemed to be nice and peaceful for the last decade. And then when they allowed uh, these boats to hall scene on Fridays, it was uh, it was nothing but trouble. I mean, we've had. Uh, one boat that was a real uh, jerk. He's since been banned. Uh, but at any sunrise morning, you go into Boston Harbor, there's five boats working inside the harbor. And uh, like I said in my comments a year ago, when they were going to open this up, that uh, th these, um, as a charter boat captain, we depend on the, the pogies to be there for, for the striped bass that we're catching. And there, there's one sure way to to scatter the pogies and shut off a good striper bite 
is to get four or five Hall team boats working in very close areas. They're not outside of Boston Harbor. All five of these boats are inside of Deer Island, uh, working in very close proximity uh, to the fishing boats that are there. And like I said a year ago, the, the, these fish need a day of rest. Four days of constant bombardment by five boats is enough. You know, let, let them take a break on Fridays. Let the charter boats and the recreational fishermen have access to these pogies and the striped bass that are under them because uh, it, it's really screwing, it's screwing us up. And I'd also like to say that, you know, last year when we were commenting, there was a big concern about the pogie die-offs that are happening and allowing these boats in there on Fridays would help with the pogie die-off. It didn't help at all. The pogie still died off. If the state is so concerned about the pogie die off, they know it's going to happen on the full moon in September. They can open up it up the day before the full moon in September and let them have access to uh, the Upper Mystic River and they can take, you know, all, all the pogies they wanted in, in that one day, right before the die off. It's the same die off that happens every year. Um, again, I'd just like to go on the record and say that I, I wholeheartedly, adamantly would like to see Fridays completely closed inside of Boston Harbor for any type of scening activity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mike. Rob Savino, you kind of mute yourself. Yeah, I, I support what Mike, what Mike is also saying. I, I think, uh, I think Fridays is a bit much. Um, I think that, that having the saners coming inside into such close quarters has definitely created quite a bit of conflict. Uh, as I said last year, that, that if we were talking about some of the smaller seining boats coming inside, it, it may not be as much of a problem, um, but the problem is, is then again, you can't uh, discriminate one boat to the other. But when you have some boats that are coming in that are really big saners, and, and I know that there were some conflicts with them and, and some of the traffic not just charter boats, but there was some of the shipping traffic and things like that with, with setting seines up and things like that right into channels and what have you. So I do, I do support a Friday closure and, and I, would, I would have a, a, another look at, at the amount of fish that could be taken inside Deer Island as far as the size boat that's coming in seining. When you get some of those really big ones coming in, they were really putting a, a pretty pretty good hurt on the fishery. That's all. Thank you, Rob. I would also hey one one quick thing on on the note of this, and I I've said this a million times at these meetings. Uh, it's really nice for folks of us in this industry to see who's attending the meeting. If we could figure this out on these Rob, webinars, as I told you last year, this isn't an option for Zoom. We've looked into it. The way our Zoom account is run and the way these webinars are run. The, that that's not a functionality that they offer, but thank you. Jared, is there a way to reveal a list of attendees? Yeah, we can, a list of attendees can produce a request at the end of the meeting. Yep. You know, what you can really do is, is instead of setting it up like a council meeting, is you can have it basically open as, as everybody who's attending is a participant, and then you'll see all of the attendees. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Bob Hanna. How you doing? You hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, I, I support keeping it open on Friday only for the reason is, you know, Salem was a prime example of it. The last of the season, they were all jammed up in there and there were boats up inside where they weren't supposed to be because everybody was jammed up in there. And, and as far as the big boats in Boston Harbor, the only big boat in there was the carrier, the Kingfisher. And they weren't, they weren't engaged in actually setting a net. They, they carry the fish. So the, the other boats are all in the 35 to 50 foot range, which isn't a big boat. So I, I do support the keeping it open in, uh, on a Friday in, in Boston. And if, and if I can quote the Salem Harbor Master, when we had that closed on Fridays, he said a Friday is no different than a Monday for him. So it didn't matter to him on, on Friday fishing. 
Thanks, Bob. Eric Lorenzen. Hello. Hi, Eric. I, uh, I support Fridays uh, just because it's my backyard and it saves me from having to travel to Salem and back with a heavy load of fish. I, uh, I do my best to get along with everybody and try not to, you know, be too aggressive or anything like that. I, but I only have control over my own operation. It's the other operations that you know, are the wild card. But uh, that's all I got. Thank you, Eric. Scott Jolly, you can unmute yourself. Okay, did it work this time? I got you this time, Scott. All right. All right, so uh, I am in favor of um, stopping Friday fishing. Um, <clears throat> I personally think that in harbor seining is should be banned altogether. Um, we know it's the main forage of striped bass. Um, I am a commercial striped bass fisherman, by the way, and our days are last year, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And as you know, we're trying to make a living. We're targeting the schools of pogies, which is where the bass are holding. And we're battling with these boats um, who just have that I'm bigger than you mentality and just kind of do what they want. And most of them could care less about the rest of us. Um, and, you know, a big thing these days is saving the striped bass, saving the striped bass. I mean, you're getting a lot of die off from these you know, nets, um, accidentally catching these stripers and you're taking their main food source. So the striped bass come in in large numbers towards the end of the summer, you know, more so they're, they're holding up here in Boston Harbor. And by the time that happens, all the pogies are gone and, you know, you're taking their main forage. Um, so yeah, I'm all for it. Letting, give, giving them a day off. I, I'd like to see them not be able to be in the Harbor at all, to be honest. That's you, all. Scott. All right, Dan, that's all I'm seeing for. Uh... That's great. All right, well, thanks. Thanks, folks. I appreciate the comments. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, the issue pertaining to a bluefish commercial minimum size. And Jared is going to take that one as well. OK. Um, so we are looking at um, having some discussions with the Massachusetts Environmental Police at the end of the fishing season uh, in 2021. And one of the things that came up was the what they viewed as an increase in individuals obtaining the state's commercial fishing permit uh, to retain bluefish, particularly snapper blues, uh, in excess of the recreational limit. Um, and we have several concerns about this activity. First, if the catch is, we do not require commercial catch to be sold in Massachusetts. We allow commercial fishermen to retain um, fish caught under their commercial per permit for personal or family use. Uh, we don't have a mandatory sale requirement. So not all catch is counted against the, um, against the quota. So we rely on that catch being accounted for through individuals reporting that on their trip level reports and it, it's likely that there that this catch of um, snapper blues or recreational blues being taken under the commercial permit is um, being underreported um, and, and, and that's problematic for conservation and management issues. Uh, we discussed uh, a potential minimum size with some seafood dealers and some commercial fishermen and there seemed to be a preference for 18 inch plus fish and that would be uh, commensurate with what uh, Rhode Island has a, as their minimum size. So we think that that would resolve um, a lot of the issue that environmental law enforcement were encountering this year when it came to the use of a commercial permit to harvest bluefish in excess of the recreational limit, particularly that, that snapper uh, bluefish class, uh, because you'd be excluding them from the commercial harvest by adopting an 18 inch mineral size. So same drill as last time. If you have questions, comments, raise your hand. They'll create a queue and I will uh, recognize you as they come in.
All right, Dan, I'm not seeing any comments on this. Oh, never mind. Hold on. Jaron? Yes, I, Jaron Fried and Lucky Seven Charters. Sorry, right sorry, I. I, sorry, I just uh, I just uh, logged on here, and I understand that I missed my my time to comment regarding the uh, you know the folks um, you know netting the uh, Manhattan and the and the harbor. And I just did want to let you know that I'm one of those folks that submitted some pictures um, regarding regarding this and having competing fishing going on in the in the harbor. Um, you know, I think it's definitely dangerous. Uh, and, and, and certainly certainly not needed. So I just did want to put my comment on record there. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mike Delzingo. Yeah, hi, what, what would the minimum size be? Do, do you know? There is no talking? current minimum size for bluefish. Yeah, but if they're talking about a minimum commercial size, do they, do they say what that's gonna be? 18 inches. Okay. Uh, my only comment is that most of the bluefish you're going to catch here will, are going to have their jaws ripped off, uh, so they're going to die anyways. Uh, a, a lot of the bluefish you catch are on wire or heavy tackle, um, you're tearing the fish up. So releasing a fish that you've caught commercially, releasing a bluefish that you've caught commercially, they don't have a, a tough jaw structure like a striper does. You're going to rip their lower jaw off or you know, pull their teeth out. Uh, especially you, you drag in the uh, umbrellas or or uh, like rapalas on wire. Uh, the, the fish aren't uh, set for a healthy release when you're fighting them on that, that kind of tackle. You're not you're not fighting them on light tackle, spinning rods, stuff like that. Your commercial fishing, you're you're just trying to get them in the boat as fast as possible. And I would think a minimum size is going to uh, hurt the uh, you know if you would the re release mortality of these fish. Thank you. So, so, Mike, is there a different minimum size, that, or are you suggesting we shouldn't have any minimum size? No, I suggest that you don't have a minimum size. Just keep it status quo that there is no minimum size. I don't see the point of. Uh, yeah. Of All right. Well, let me explain. Did Jared just mention? So, um, we have a three fish limit for recreational anglers, and Correct. what the environmental police have found is that some anglers go out and for thirty-five dollars buy a commercial rod and reel permit and take unlimited amounts of, of bluefish and, and especially in the snapper sizes. Um, and one way to, to prevent that from happening is to create a commercial minimum size so that if, if folks are taking fish under the authority of a commercial permit, at least they would be in the upper range where they're more likely to be sold and not taken home. So Rhode Island has an 18 inch minimum size where you know we propose that just because our neighbor has it, we could be smaller, but uh, we do think that it, this uh, would be a, 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 um, a good tool to discourage that kind of activity. Okay. What about a minimum size for the recreational? Have they talked about that instead? Or? No, because we have a snapper fishery where the, some people like to take those, yeah, you know, large, those young of the year anything. fish that could be eight, nine, ten inches. And sometimes people will fill the buckets with those. So that's the dilemma. Okay, but doesn't that just come down to just outright poaching that your your commercial fishing on a recreational day? No, there is no day um, day on or off in the bluefish commercial fishery, unlike striped bass. Yeah, but if you're it's, over your three fish limit, I mean, if you have re recreational anglers on your boat, well, I guess I can see where that would be a problem. Yeah, so I think the, the better advice to us is, well, I, I mean, you can advise us to not to have any, but a second option would be maybe... 18 inches is too large. Maybe it should be a different number. Um, you know, that's the kind of feedback we're looking for. Uh, I, I would think if you were going to implement one that 18 inches would be fine, okay. especially in Boston. We don't really get those little tiny snapper ones. The ones we get are going to be, you know, four or five pounds anyway, or the big 15 pounder. So, right. I don't think that's going to affect the Boston fishery. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mike. You got Tom, Tom Smith. Smith. 
Tom, you there? Yeah, you got me? I do. Nope, it's muted. Well, we had you. Okay. Okay. You got me now? I do. Um, okay. I, I feel like the 18 inch size proposal is a bit too much. It was stated earlier that it's not a conservation measure, but, but more to do with a wreck fisherman buying a commercial permit and filling their buckets with snappers to circumvent the, the rules and take more than the three bluefish that they're supposed to. So I, I'm, I'm good with that. I agree. That can be an issue. I, I haven't seen it myself lately, but I guess in areas there's a lot of snappers like we used to see them here. Um, I just feel like 15 or 16 inches would be more of a realistic size that would more than accomplish the goal of reducing the snapper. Most snappers in my experience are eight to 12 inches long. When I see people catching them in their buckets, um, they're, not, they're not 15, 16, up to 18 inches. Um, and those fish also haven't even spawned once, those eight to 12 inch fish. Uh, the strike net fishery that I'm involved in has a five inch minimum stretch mesh size, which is by far the most stringent on the East Coast. Um, there are times that we catch a good amount of four pound bluefish, which is the smallest size we will see in a five inch mesh. I don't know exactly how long a, a four pound bluefish is, but if you look at some of the length to weight charts, it tells you that a four pound bluefish is 18 inches. So that could be a problem. Um, I would propose, I got three options here. I would propose, I, first one being, I'd wait a season to, so we can collect more data by measuring a hundred or so bluefish, you know, 18 inches long to see, or, or measuring the four pound bluefish to see how long they are, you know, see if they are 18 in uh or implement a smaller size. I think I think 14 to 15, maybe 16 inches would more than accomplish your goal. And um, lastly, I would propose an exemption for the strike net fishery since we don't catch snappers and we have a minimum mesh size already in place. Um, the smallest fish we catch being four pounds is already spawned twice. Um, we just don't want to be in a situation where we catch up four pound bluefish, we measure it, it's 17 and a half inches long and you got to throw it back dead. That would, that would just be awful. But, uh, all right, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Rob Savina. Hi, thank you. I, um, I don't support the 18 inches, and I'll, I'll give you the reasons why I'm saying that at this point. Um, one is I think uh, dead discards for it will go up. Um, I do understand uh, the thought process behind the recreational guy getting a commercial permit and wanting to keep more. I think that's, in essence, the problem that needs to be addressed because I would anticipate that that's happening amongst other fisheries too. Um, so, so I've been trying to have discussions with other guys about how do you prevent that? And how do you prevent guys from getting a commercial license of any sort and keeping the fish for personal consumption? And the only thing I can come up with is some sort of regulation or some sort of system um, that any fish that is caught commercially has to be sold to the market with whatever way system we can figure out to, to do that. Um, because I would also anticipate you're seeing an increase of commercial striped bass licenses because of that very same reason. But, uh, but that's a whole nother, nother discussion uh, that's my thought process on it is, is really to make sure that, that fish that are caught commercially go to the market. Um, so, so, but I do, I do, uh, not support a, an 18 inch cause I just think dead discards are going to go through the roof on that. 
Thank you, Rob. Jaron? Yes, thank you. Um, quick question or clarification. Um, I have a charter permit, also commercial. If, um, if I'm looking to go out tuna fishing and use bluefish for bait, would I be limited to needing to only keep anything over 18 inches? How does that work um, regarding, regarding that scenario? Because I understand lots of people last year were using uh, bluefish for bait out in the bay. You Good use question. Bluefish for bait on a charter, and that charter may retain a giant bluefin that may be sold. Um, that would, you could go about, I think you could go about that two ways. You could fish under your commercial bluefish permit um, and take bluefish that would have to adhere to whatever the minimum size we may or may not adopt is, or you'd be subject to the three fish per angler recreational bluefish limit. Actually, it's five, charter, Jared, if he's a charter boat. Five fish on a charter boat, rather, uh, as a as an effective creel limit uh, for bait. Okay, so if I'm going to be fishing commercially, and I'm going to keep the tuna, the the bluefish also needs to be greater than 18 inches. I need to make that choice at the dock. No, no, so the we prohibit the mixing of recreational and commercial trips, except for recreational trips where a bluefin may be retained for commercial purposes. So those, those um, char a bluefin charter, you wouldn't be also prohibited from doing other recreational fishing on. So you Got could it. either fish under the commercial rules or the recreational bluefish rules. Okay, great. And, uh, and just to uh, back up to Rob's point, something to consider is, um, you know, most most folks that are doing commercial um, fishing may want to, you know, up the ante on what's required for safety gear. I, we spend a lot of money on our boats with making sure that they're, you know, they're up to snuff with safety gear with, you know, um, and uh, that's that might be something that would prohibit it, you know, somebody that's just looking to go out there and, and, uh, and take advantage of the commercial rules. Uh, just a thought there. Thank you. Yeah, Jeremy, can I follow up? Um, so the scenario you just described where your patrons are allowed five bluefish um, as, as recreational anglers, that's sufficient for your needs, right? For bait, like if, if it's you and a mate and some number of clients, you wouldn't need more than five per angler, would you? Five per angler? No. Yeah. So, so yeah. So in that situation, you know, you'd be able to... Um, go out and, and, and um, fish as a recreational charter with those um, undersized bluefish, essentially five per angler. And then if you caught a bluefin tuna um, and, and you intended to sell it, that's the one area where we do allow the mixing of, of uh, commercial and recreational activity on the same trip. So I think our rules would cover you there. Great, so, thank you for that. Yep. Okay. Scott Jolly. Scott, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I, uh, here we go. You got me? Gotcha. Okay. So to, to go back what um, a gentleman a few, few people ago was saying, um, a lot of people are getting their commercial permits nowadays, especially with the slot size limit and the striped bass and like you're saying with the bluefish, um, just so they can keep a fish over 35 inches if it's a striped bass. Um, so what I believe is how he was saying, um, find a way to make sure that all commercial fish being kept are being sold. It's, I think, very simple. If, if people are getting their commercial licenses, we wait a year and then you look at the reports from all these commercial fishermen and you find a large group of them that are not Scott we lost your audio do we lose Scott completely yeah <clears throat> Dan uh we got Mike Delzingo and Rob Sabino again I, I think 
we don't want to get sidetracked and speculating about what might be going on in the striped bass fishery and instead really ask for comments. Um, yeah, we can take those the functionality of this minimum size. Yeah, if there's time at the end of the hearing, we can come back and talk about other things that may be going on in the striped bass fishery. Sure, the good plan, Jared. Bye, right. I got you, Mike Delzingo. Hi, I just wanted to know what is the issue with a commercial fisherman bringing home fish for himself for for um recreational purposes it's it's been that there's never there hasn't been a law saying that commercial fish have to be sold so if you have a massachusetts boat permit and you go out and you take your 25 pounds of ground fish you don't have to sell that you can bring that home yeah mike you, mike we understand that what we're what we're doing here is we're trying to identify a size because what we've been told is there is no commercial market for for bluefish below a certain size so let's let's say the number 16 okay and and there are some instances where some people are buying the commercial permit and loading up on snapper blues below 16 inches so this was just a proposal to kind of get at this problem i mean it's okay. not a complete solution uh, okay. but it's it, it just seemed like a clean way to do it and consistent with what we heard from some other members tonight. I, I think it, yeah. getting tracked into making it, that all commercial fish needs to be sold and recorded is you know is you've got a yeah. lot of fisheries to, to yeah yeah that's why we're not going to continue that yeah that conversation but thank you for that yeah you might have a good approach here with a minimum mm -hmm. size on the bluefish i don't know what the minimum size would be like jay around said uh you know we use them for tuna baits we'd like them 12 inches yeah that and that case. that would be fine because those are essentially um caught under the under the sort of the authority of recreational fishing yeah, uh, yeah. permits so that okay. that's wouldn't be affected all right thank you yep okay i think um I think yeah. we've heard from everybody. Yeah, um, we'll move on. Got a hand up. Yep. Okay. Hold on. We got one more. We got Phil Coates. Sure. Phil, go right ahead. Phil, you're muted. Can't hear you, Phil. You're muffled. So I can't hear a thing you're saying. All right, so we'll come back to you later. All right, so we're going to move on to the striped bass control date. Uh, this first slide just has a couple of permitting trends. Uh, shows we issue about 4,000 to 5,000 permits a year. That's uh, been consistent over pretty much the past decade, and about you know 1,200 of them are actively fished. Um, you know, we look at uh, you know there was a big climb and did not fish permits in 2020, which isn't all that surprising given the. Uh, given the pandemic and the funkiness of that year as a, in its impact on commercial fishery. Then we did an analysis of kind of the types of permits we issue every year, renewals that are inactive, renewals that are fished but not for striped bass, renewals that are active, uh, new permits that are inactive, new permits that are fished with no striped bass, and um, new permits that are active to kind of just show how those various classes track over time. Um, but you know more into the discussion of a control date this next slide gets into um our control date now i believe is like september 8th 2013 uh and you've seen for 2013 to 2021 that there has been a large geographic shift in where this fishery is occurring um you know from from the south to the north we have orange is south shore but that's cape cod the islands and, and uh, Plymouth County. And then the North Shore is everything north of that, Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex. So we've seen a big jump, uh, particularly over the past three years and in, in the amount of landings occurring in ports within the North Shore. Uh, and should 
we want to ever utilize a control day to adjust how the fishery is permitted or managed. Uh, we'd want to ensure that it was inclusive of such a shift uh, so that we would not be um, maintaining a or eliminating people from this fishery or eliminating access to this fishery among a group of people um, who have been recently participating in it, um, as, as is the case here. So what we're looking to do is to is to adopt a control date that would be the day before the fishery starts this year, June 14th, 2022. And that would replace the old September 8th, 2013 control day. Um, it would be inclusive of this most recent northward uh, shift um, and this past uh, fishing season. Uh, we're not proposing to use this control date at, that at this time, so there's no additional proposal to adjust management or permitting based on that, but just to update the existing control date because it's a decade old and we've seen a shift in where this fishery is occurring over the past three to four years. So I'll take any questions or comments on that. Yeah, and Jared, if I could, I would um, stress the, the, the second point you made. The first point you made is about the shift in, in geography. So this allows um, maybe if folks from another part of the state that maybe wasn't so active in the time period, the earlier time period. But for me personally, I'm more concerned about having a stale control date that is eight, at least eight years old or almost 10. And, um, you know, you, to let's face it, the purpose of a control date is potentially to um, limit entry, which means someone who bought this permit after the control date uh, wouldn't be eligible to continue. And the thought of having someone participate in an activity for eight to 10 years and then to be told they couldn't continue is, is uh, that's a difficult one. And so uh, we need fresh control dates if we were ever going to use them. So it's, uh, it's, it's just the, the, the staleness that bothers me more than the ge geographical sh geographic shift, but both are important. Thanks for letting me weigh in. Rob Savino. Yeah, just a quick question, not necessarily a comment at this point. Has there been any discussion um, along with the control date as far as minimum poundage catch or anything like that we're not proposing any changes in management or uh permitting based on this control date uh, but as dan said you know the control the purpose of a control date is to limit entry into a fishery so should we go towards a limited entry scheme you know those would be the types of things we're looking at that's not what we're proposing today and we haven't run any analyses on that and yeah. Rob, if I could follow up, um, yeah. the, the, the issues that, that strike me, um, you know, the, um, the issue of, uh, of tagging and the issue of the quota. The first one on tagging, right now we have dealer tagging, which is convenient for the fishermen and for us as administrators because the thought of giving out um, tags to over 4,000 fishery participants would be um, uh, impossible for us. I mean, we'd, we'd need to hire a couple of full-time employees just to do that, or many part-time employees. Um, so that's that's just not possible. Um, and the other thing is quota. It, as striped bass uh, management plans evolve, uh, should we take uh, severe quota cuts in the future? We, we might want to reduce the number of participants in the fishery. And if we were to um, take on either a tagging program where the harvesters would have to tag, or if we had our quota reduced dramatically, then it just wouldn't make sense to allow uh, over 4,000 participants. Uh, we just couldn't, um, we couldn't manage it. So this is, this is just kind of a, a planning exercise for us that should any of those things come to pass and we needed to reduce the number of eligible participants, it would just be much fairer if we had a control date that was fresher. But yeah. there ha honestly hasn't been, uh, you know, any any uh, substantive discussion about either. But I can imagine, um, you know, that that uh, coming to pass. But but honestly, there's no evidence at this time. Yeah. See, this is where I see the difficulty is happening. And and back way back when, when we first talked about 
tags for, for the bluefish on the dealer level. Um, I, I actually proposed to Paul, uh, Paul Diodotti at the time, that, that we're really tagging at the wrong point in time. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you send tags out to 4,000 people, by no means. Um, you can still have the dealers uh, get the tags, but the tag then goes to the fishermen and they get them from their buyer. Uh, that, that's how I would, would try to do it. I've been talking about this with guys and trying to figure this out and uh, trying to see the pros and cons to it. I mean, there's a lot of pros, there's a lot of cons. Um, I, I see it, I know it's a whole nother uh, object for discussion, but I bet you if you put tags at the point of harvest, um, you probably would end up seeing a lot of your commercial licensing go down because I know for a fact, there's plenty of guys. I had a 16 year old kid say, yeah, I'm getting my commercial license this year because I want to keep bigger fish. I'm like, yeah, well, that's a loophole you can get into, right? But uh, that's a discussion that needs to happen at another time. Uh, the control date, I think is fine with me. I just don't want to see anybody get knocked out because when they implemented a control date for the codfish, I was one of those victims that didn't have enough history but had the license over time, but then they had the control date and initiated a minimum poundage over X amount of years, and I fell out of it. And I wouldn't want to see anybody falling out of this. That's that's really my point on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Rob. Rob, yeah. Mike. Mike's next. <laughs> Mike Delzinga. Hi. Um, I. I I don't have a problem with the control date and to be honest it's only because i'm in the fishery and my son is in the fishery so my family's permits are safe you could say so i don't really have an opinion as to the other side who would get uh, who would not get a permit uh, but like rob said i don't want to see anybody kicked out of the fishery uh if you if you um do a control date, you should uh Whoever has that permit at the day of that control date should be able to keep the permit uh, until they transfer it and not be uh, not be thrown out because of poundage or landings or or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Michael Alisi. Hi. Hi. I agree with the um, control date uh, in 2013. I was like in college. It was a long time ago, and now I'm an active commercial fisherman for five years, so it would hurt bad to be kicked out. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, Dan, that's all yep. I'm seeing on this, so we'll move on to um, housekeeping. Uh, I'm going to run through each of the four of these. Um, at once, and then in terms of taking comment, uh, you can comment on whichever one you uh, wish to comment on. Uh, first one, we have an owner operator rule, which means the permit holder uh, must be the individual operating the vessel. Um, when it's occurring, this applies in all our commercial trap fisheries, our lobster, coastal lobster fishery, our fish pot fisheries, and our well pot fishery. Uh, over the winter, it's come up as questions as we uh, do our annual meetings with law enforcement as to whether this rule extends to the sale of fish caught. Um, meaning, does the permit holder, if it's an owner operator fishery, does that permit holder need to be the person that trucks the fish to the fish market or is on the vessel when the when the truck comes to get it? Um, or can a, can a, um, a deckhand do that for them? Um, and you know, if so, does that undermine the the the, the purpose of the owner operator rule? Uh, second, uh, there is a rule um, on our books that basically says four higher operators are responsible for the, or may be held responsible for the non-conforming catch of their clients. Um, when this rule was enacted, we added some additional language to. Uh, to meet the concerns of a head boat operator, um, that this should only, you know, that that officers should be using their discretion in enforcing this rule. Um, I 100% agree that 
that officers should be enforcing their discretion and enforcing this rule and our all rules. Uh, officer discretion is a uh, well understood enforcement tool. Um, the problem with using it in this rule is it, it begs the question, um, how should they be using it? If we had an adjudicatory hearing on a uh, for hire permit holder last year um, who had no, a number of violations on a number of different occasions um, where his uh, everyone on his vessel, you know, bag limit, size limit, seasons, there were no rules. It was a six pack charter. There were, uh, I think, three incidents over the course of two years where substantial violations were found. And, and this this came up and what was argued and what became confusing and, and why we're here tonight to discuss this is, you know, they basically, it, it was basically argued that he complied with the minimum standards, meaning he had, uh, you know, a poster and he allegedly told his, the, 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 the folks on his boat that what the limits were and therefore, you know, the officer should use their discretion to, to not, um, enforce anything on the for hire operator. And yeah, that, that wasn't the point of the rule. It, it's become um, obtuse. And I think we'd be well served um, on the enforcement and compliance end of things to eliminate that language um, and just rely on officer discretion as a enforcement tool in handling this and not try to reinvent the wheel through adding language about it in a regulation. Um, the next aspect of this is a permitting clarification. Our permitting language regarding the transfer of limited entry endorsements currently reads, limited entry regulated permit endorsements that are not postmarked or received by DMF prior to midnight on the last day of February may be approved. Um, we wanna change that to may not be approved just so the intention is more clear effectively they mean the same thing because may or may not, um, it, it, it doesn't make, the, the, the inverse may be true. So we just want to say more clearly that they may not be approved. And then lastly, last year, we prohibited the use of blue crab or use of traps to catch blue crabs. And with that prohibition, we just want to require or make clear that all uh, recreational lobster and crab traps be configured to meet the lobster trap specifications. We don't want to see the proliferation of a new trap designed to catch Jonah crabs in in state waters. Um, we much prefer to just you know if you're setting your lobster trap and catch Jonah crabs in your recreational lobster trap, keep them. But let's not be introducing new gear um, into that fixed gear fishery. So those are the four uh, housekeeping measures that we're looking to. Uh, take comment on. So if anyone has anything, I'll, I'll we'll raise your hand and we'll, we'll recognize you. Rob Savina. Yeah, just just real, uh, real quickly. Um, the uh, to rescind the language on the four hire vessel and and leave it up to the to the law enforcement uh, discretion. Um, that seems like it's a, a pretty gray area there. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm getting it completely on what you're trying so, to achieve there. I was hoping so, you could clarify So let me, let me explain it another way. In no other rule do we say the law enforcement has the discretion to enforce the rule. That is just established as part of the tools that they use is that they have discretion in this rule this is the one rule where we come out and say law enforcement has the discretion to enforce this on the patrons or on the permit holder uh, or on the captain and, and it becomes confusing as to well why do we say it there why don't we say it elsewhere and 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 what any such standards are um, in any of our other rules law enforcement has the discretion to enforce our rules as they as they deem necessary or, or in fit. And I think from an enforcement compliance end of things, I'd be much more comfortable with just maintaining that 
um, existing uh, reality rather than having regulatory language because it only muddies the water. Um, it, it doesn't really accomplish anything that, that, that doesn't already exist because discretion exists. It only muddies the water as to how it exists. So Rob, if I could follow up, um, when the rule was enacted, I, mean, I think everybody was comfortable that charter boat operators are six pack operations. It's, e it's, uh, it's easier to keep clients accountable for the, on the rules than it might be on a party boat. And so at the time we had a party boat operator uh, on the commission and he had a certain level of discomfort that, you know, cause he's up in the wheelhouse and he's trying to keep the boat safe and he's not sort of policing the activity of people out on the, on the back deck, especially when there could be up to a hundred people doing it. And so a compromise was to add this, this language to, to um, allow discretion as long as the, the, uh, the rules were posted and the, and the rules were announced, et cetera. So I think we've lived with this rule for a, a full decade now. And what we've come to learn is that, yeah, that's, that is the case that the charter boat uh, patrons um, are under the watchful eye of the, of the captain, the party boat uh, patrons, uh, not so much. And the fact that Jared has described this rule and, and embedded in it talks about discretion. Officers already use discretion and officers that are familiar with, with the challenges of, of um, having a large number of clients uh, on the boat that can sometimes be um, you know, difficult to, to manage. Um, you know, the officers need to figure that out and they do. And I, and I think we have a few officers on the, um, on the call tonight who, if they want to describe those challenges, they can. Um, but, you know, when, what Jared described was a charter boat operator who had clients who were absolutely violating everything, including the season, the bag and the size. And, um, and when we went to uh, revoke his permit, he, he points to this language and says, oh, the officer shouldn't, you know, take my permit away, you know, through this hearing process, he should uses discretion. <laughs> it's like, really? So anyway, it's, it's, like I said, we're, we're 10 years into this and um, I, I, we're confident that the law enforcement officers, you know, will use that discretion and anything that happens in a hearing, of course, can be challenged in a, in a, in front of a judge. You know, when I say a hearing, we have a magistrate and, and we can do things um, uh, taken, we can take actions administratively on permits outside of the courts. And that's, that's the process that Jerry was describing. And we have revoked this individuals um, and others uh, charter permits when they, there was such um, gross uh, violations. Does that help? Yeah, yeah it does. It does. And, and I remember uh, years back when we, we talked about this rule and, and I, I completely agree with everything you've said there, where Whereas, uh, you know, a guide, let's call it the three categories, the guide boats, the charter boats, and the party boats. Sure, if, if I was a party boat captain, I'd be very much worried about, you know, what one of the 75 or 100 people are doing on board, because it, that would be my responsibility. And, and I would hope that if one guy's breaking the laws and what have you, then, then yes, I, I get it. A charter boat, same thing. I mean, for me, you know, they're right there. And, and if, if uh, if the captain can't enforce the laws and the rules right there, well, that, that's that's definitely shame on him. I hear you. OK, uh, so I'm, I'm still I'm still in agreement with with everything you're saying there. And, and just I still don't understand where the the the, the CFR language would come in as far as, uh, uh, you know, it, rescinding the language for officer discretion. So I guess, therefore, I'm I'm probably not in favor of it, because I don't want to rescind the language. I'd rather still have the officer have discretion. They still would. Yeah. They still okay. would. Oh, they still would. They oh, you just want to take that's, it, you just want to take it out of, you want to take I, it out of the written. Uh, exactly. The, I think your confusion on this has hit the nail on the head as to why we want to remove it. Yeah. It's because it is confusing and it doesn't accomplish anything that doesn't already exist. I see. So it, yeah. it, it's redundant in, in that way, and it's confusing because it 
it, it, it kind of begs the question as to, well, why do you have it there? What else are you trying to accomplish? And we're not. We're just basically, you know, telling law enforcement to do what they already do. Yeah, for example, they could write a war or they could do nothing or they could write a warning or they could cite the passenger or they could cite the captain. And so all all four levels of enforcement constitute discretion. And so that already exists. And the fact that we have language in the in the regulation that says, you know, officers shall use discretion um, as long as the um, the rules were properly posted and, and announcement, announcements were being made. Um, you know, it, it seemed like the, the right thing to do at the time 10 years ago. Um, but in hindsight, it's it's only served to create kind of confusion when we when we go for, you know, things like suspension or revocation. It's, you know, the created a loophole. Yeah, it did. It it, it, it creates this gray area that Jared's trying to explain, you know, this psychological yeah. gray area. All right, Rob, thank you. All right, Dan, I'm not seeing anyone else queued up in the comments section um, with their hands up so we can move on to final instructions. That'll be great. So, so, go right yeah, so, ahead. so, um, so everyone um, who's on this call and anyone who might watch it on the Zoom or, or get other word, um, we will keep the public comment period open for another you know, week and a half. Um, through Sunday, uh, I'm sorry, this Sunday, this Sunday, March 20th, so the end of the week. Um, and please use the marine.fish mailbox. If you did send me an email directly, I'll do my best to get it to, to the folks who collect these, but it's so much easier for staff to go into that one mailbox and they know that that's the repository for all the comments and they don't have to call all the staff, hey, did you have any comments people may have sent to you directly? So it's much, much more efficient, much more effective if you use that, that uh, email address. So please uh, let us know by um, Sunday, March 20th, if, if you would like to, um, if you're going to be sending us anything. And so Jared, having said that, um, you know, we can close the hearing and we can stay on if, if there's other comments that you had mentioned earlier, if there are any comments on issues outside of this agenda, we could take those at this time. And with that, Dan, I'm going to um, stop the recording.